Uh, did you hear about what happened to, uh, to Steve Harvey about three weeks ago? He was, um, he was the MC for the Miss Universe beauty pageant. And when it came time to that cl- climactic moment when he was to announce the, the winner of the pageant, Steve Harvey made a terrible mistake. Rather than reading off the card the name of the true winner, he actually announced that the winner was Miss Columbia, who was actually the first runner-up. And so Miss Columbia went to the center stage and had the crown placed on her head when Steve Harvey realized that he had made a terrible mistake. And he said, wait a minute, I have to apologize. And he explained what had happened. And he said, now the true winner is actually Miss Philippines. Can you imagine a more embarrassing moment for a celebrity like Steve Harvey? I mean, he failed on primetime television. There's no hiding it. And I'm sure that for the years to come, they're going to replay his mistake over and over again. Well, open your Bibles with me this morning to John chapter 21 because the fact is that Steve Harvey goofed up in prime time, but he's not the first one to do that. In fact, Jesus' main man who would be the leader of the disciples and the leader of his church was also a man who messed up in prime time. His name was Peter. And I want us to read about this episode in Peter's life. It happens at the very end of the gospel, at the very end of the story of Jesus here on earth. In John chapter 21, I pick up reading in verse 1, where it says that afterward Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, um, The sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciples whom the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with that, uh, so many, in uh, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now I'm going to have some application that you'll find there on your note sheet at the end of the message. But we'll better understand this this episode in Peter's life if if we know the back story that happens here. You see, Peter is a guy that I think all of us and most of us would would identify with, Uh, not the Apostle Peter of the book of Acts who performed mighty miracles and preached powerful sermons, but but the uh, Simon Peter of, of the Gospels. Simon was a guy who was rather impulsive. He was uh, fickle. There were times that he spoke before thinking. Um... He was prone to give answers and reactions that were wrong. There were times that his faith faltered and it got him into trouble. And uh, and as we're going to see in just a moment, he failed Jesus in prime time. Now, as I said earlier, we just returned from the Sea of Galilee uh, from from Israel and and we had the opportunity to 
to visit the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee where, where Jesus was walking one day and he saw Peter and his brother Andrew, fishermen. And he said to them in Mark chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, he said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. That happens there on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And for the next three years, um, Peter walked with Jesus and served alongside Jesus. He heard Jesus' amazing wisdom as he taught he, um, he, he, was, he was so close to Jesus, I'm sure that he, he could not think of, of a time that he wouldn't be right there with Jesus for the rest of his life. He watched Jesus perform mirac- uh, amazing miracles, and one of them was particularly personal uh, to Peter because uh, we, we visited the site of, uh, in Capernaum, the ancient city of Capernaum, where they had uncovered the the foundation of uh, the synagogue where Jesus spoke there in Capernaum. And not far from this, just, just over to the right of the, where this photo was taken, is, uh, are the ruins of what they believe was the house of Peter's mother-in-law. And we're told in, uh, in Matthew chapter, chapter 8 that Jesus came to Capernaum on one occasion when Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a fever, apparently very, very ill. And Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. So this is not just Peter observing Jesus doing amazing things. This was something personal. It had touched his, his own family. Now, we also took a cold, windy boat ride out on the Sea of Galilee where Peter and the disciples had one of the most frightening experiences of their life. A fierce storm arose, and they thought they were going to die. Uh, and, and the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 14 that Jesus came walking to them on the water, and they were, they were terrified. And remember, it was there that Peter's, Peter said, Lord, if it's you, would tell me to come to you on the water. And at the command of Jesus, Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus. And he did just fine until he began to look around and see the wind and the waves. And his faith faltered. And he began to sink. And Jesus had to, uh, had to rescue him. And so there again, we, we see documented Peter's lack of faith. But Jesus didn't give up on Peter a short time after that. He took his disciples uh, on on a kind of retreat up into the northern Galilee to a place called Caesarea Philippi. It's a very beautiful setting, and we were able to visit that place where Jesus asked the question of his disciples, who do men say that I am? And and that is when Peter made that amazing confession in Matthew 16, 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And he said, I tell you the truth that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not overcome it. Now, in Caesarea Philippi, there was a a well-known cave. In fact, through the years, even before the time of Jesus, pagans had built temples here, believing that the cave, that all caves are the gate to the underworld. So whenever they saw a cave, it was a gate to to hell, the gate to Hades. And so Jesus used this well-known cave as a backdrop to his statement that he made. He said that upon this rock, upon the rock and the foundation of the confession that Jesus is Lord, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. And Peter is sitting and listening to all of this. But his confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God is is all the more amazing in light of what happens just a few verses later in Matthew chapter 16. Because here we see again Peter's flaws showing up uh, for everyone to see. You see, Jesus explained that he must suffer 
and die on the cross. And in Matthew 16, 22, it says that Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. So Peter went from praising Christ, praising Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, to rebuking Jesus. Never, Lord, we're not going to let that happen to you. Jesus went from saying, Simon, you're blessed, to having say, to say, Simon, you're like Satan. You're a stumbling block. You don't have in mind the things of God. You have in mind the things of man. That's the way it went with Peter all the time. And, uh, and so we come fast forward, if you will, to the night before Jesus was crucified. He gathered in the upper room with his disciples to share in the Last Supper. And by the way, you can visit a chapel there that was built a thousand years ago, over the site of where they believe the upper room was located. The the actual upper room is several feet below this in in the ground in the ruins. But they've built this chapel over it. It was here that not only did Jesus share the the Last Supper with his disciples, but but he also made this prediction. He said that all of them, all of them would desert him. And in Matthew 26, 33, Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Now remember Peter. He often made statements before thinking about it. He was brash and abrupt. And so Jesus says to him in Matthew 26, 34, I tell you the truth, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Well, remember that because it's going to come back in a moment. After that, Jesus took his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray with them there. And we were able to visit the Garden of Gethsemane. In fact, we, we had a special private garden in which our group could pray together. We were there during the day. Jesus was there at night with his disciples. And you recall that Jesus went away by himself. He asked the disciples to stay back and pray. He went away by himself and he prayed that powerful prayer father if there's any way that this could this cup could pass from me then let it be so but nevertheless may your will be done not my will be done and so Jesus came back and found his disciples sleeping Matthew 26 40 and he said to Peter could you men not keep watch could you not keep praying with me for one hour and so there again Peter fails in prime time. He falls asleep. Now, I imagine that uh, most of us have fallen asleep at some time or the other trying to pray. But I would dare say that none of us had it captured on video that would go viral on YouTube. But that's the way it was for Peter. It gets worse, though. Later that evening, Jesus was betrayed by Judas. He was arrested by armed guards and and taken to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. And we're told that Peter follows along behind them, and he stops in the courtyard to see what will happen. And it was there, you remember, that three different times people came up to to Peter and asked him, aren't you one of those followers of Jesus? Don't you know Jesus? And three times he denied knowing Jesus. And after that third time, he heard the rooster crow, and he remembered that that's exactly what Jesus said would happen. And his heart was crushed that he had failed Jesus so miserably, and it says that he went away and wept bitterly. Today, over the ruins of what they believe was the house of Caiaphas, they have built this beautiful plaza, and there's a statue there, a sculpture of Peter's denying Jesus three times. Now, I would venture to say that we probably have not outright denied Jesus, but certainly there have been times that all of us have been ashamed to speak up for him and stand up for him. But I would dare say that 
no one ever erected an altar or a, a monument to our betrayal and denial of Jesus. But here it is. In prime time, once again, Peter fails. I'm sure he never imagined that he could ever reach a point in his life when he could be that far from Jesus to deny him. Well, Jesus was crucified the next day and suffering there and dying for our sins, for your sins and my sins, and yes, for Peter's sins. But we know that the story doesn't end there, that on the third day, Jesus arose from the dead, and today many believe that this is the tomb where Jesus' dead body was placed, the tomb from which Jesus was raised. And, uh, and you remember that, that Easter morning, that first Easter morning that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb only to find it empty. She, she saw there the burial clothes of Jesus lying there, and Mary is startled by the presence of an angel. And the angel said to her in Mark 16, 6, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And then the angel said, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now that's interesting. Why was Mary to go tell the disciples and Peter. Could it be that Jesus has in mind a great work of grace in Peter's life? That this one who has failed Jesus so, so miserably and so personally that Jesus has plans to restore him. Now, when, uh, if we fast forward a little bit further, we're back to the northern sea of, uh, shore of the Sea of Galilee. The risen Savior has appeared to the disciples uh, on repeated occasions, and, uh, and yet they're, they're still not sure what to do with themselves. And so they go back to their old way of life as fishermen. And they've had a disappointing night out on the lake out on the sea of galilee fishing they haven't caught anything and one morning after the disciples had spent that whole night exhausted trying to fish and catching nothing they see this stranger on the shore and soon they realize that he's not a stranger he's the lord and when they realize it's the lord they they get to the shore as quickly as possible and when they get there we read this earlier in John 21 they find that Jesus has built a fire and there he's cooking breakfast for them that's so jesus isn't it how how gracious is he that these faltering stumbling failing disciples he's still reaching out to them now you put yourselves in uh, in in peter's sandals for for just a moment and just think about how terribly he failed the Lord to deny and disown Jesus not once not twice but three times and I'm sure even though Jesus has appeared to him alive I'm sure that Peter must have wondered is there any place for me in Jesus's plans does Jesus really want a relationship with me? I, I failed him so miserably. I've done such a terrible, disgraceful thing. Is there any place in Jesus' life and ministry for me? And, and so we're not surprised that in John 21 and verse 15, that we see that when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon Son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. He repeats this two more times. Now just think about that. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus give Peter the opportunity to confess his love? three times for as many times as he denied Jesus Peter was able 
to confess his love for Jesus. That's the outrageous grace of God that restores us when we have failed miserably. And that's the difference that the cross of Jesus makes. That he took his, our sins upon himself. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. And through the death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, this kind of restoration, this kind of forgiveness, this kind of new life is possible for all of us. Amen? Now, there are several things um, in this story that amaze me about Jesus. First of all, I'm amazed that Jesus comes to us in our failures. You know, so often we think, well, I've messed up, I've sinned, I failed, and so I just need to kind of stand back away from Jesus and wait till I get my act together and clean myself up, and then I'll come to Jesus. But do you understand, friends, that Jesus comes to us in our sin and in our failures? His is a pursuing, relentlessly pursuing love. And I want you to just remember this, that Jesus loves us even when we have failed him. He loves us even when we have failed him. But there's something else that amazes me about the Lord in this story, and that is with Jesus, no failure has to be final. No failure has to be final. Uh, Do any of you watch hockey? Any of you hockey fans? You're weird. (laughs) I mean, I have to confess to you, I do not understand anything about the game. It's, it's, I don't understand the game. I don't understand the rules. To be honest with you, half the time, I can't even figure out where the puck is on the ice. I I just, it's, I'm not very good at watching hockey. Um. But there's one thing I do understand about hockey, and that's the penalty box. Because the fact is that, um, that if you commit a certain kind of foul, you get put in the penalty box for a certain number of minutes. And for that period of time, your team is playing shorthanded. But the fact is that they don't put players in the penalty box for the whole game. And Jesus doesn't want you staying in the penalty box. And some of you have just kind of put yourself there and you thought, well, I messed up in my life and so I'm just going to have to, I, I'm, I'm going to have to ride in the second class part of the plane for the rest of my life. And uh, there's really no place for me in Jesus' plans or Jesus' purposes. But let me just remind you of this, that your failures don't have to define you for the rest of your life. Rather, they can refine you for the best of your life. That's the power of the grace of God through his son, Jesus Christ. And just a few weeks later, Peter would stand before throngs of people who have gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. The Spirit of God has just fallen on the disciples on the new church. And guess who God chooses as the main spokesman to preach to that crowd? This man who sinned, who failed in prime time. That's the outrageous grace of God. There's something else here that amazes me about Jesus. And and that is that with Jesus, there's always a way back from here. There's always a way back from here. Now, Now, you may think that you've gone so far down the wrong path, so far down the wrong road that you just you're just gonna stay on that road forever. The fact is that the way it is now doesn't have to be the way it will always be. There's always a way back from here with Jesus. Wherever you are, whatever path, wrong path you've gone down, he will show you the way back. 
And so there on the northern sea shore of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus gave Peter the opportunity to confess his love. And then after all of that, he says to Peter again, John 21, 19, follow me. Follow me. That's the same thing Jesus said to Peter at the very beginning of the journey. When he met him there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee three years before, he said to Peter and Andrew, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And after three years of Peter messing up and faltering in his faith and and, and all the other things and denying Jesus three times, he comes back to say to Peter, follow me again. There on the northern sea of Galilee, probably very near where Jesus first called Peter, there is a a, a sculpture of Jesus restoring Peter. Just like there's a sculpture in Jerusalem where Peter denied Jesus. That was not the last word, the final word in, in Peter's life. Your failure doesn't have to be final, doesn't have to be fatal. That's the outrageous grace of God. Now I want to ask you to bow your heads with me, please. I'm so thankful today that that the message of the gospel is for sinners. And all of us have sinned. The reason we we fail and the reason we make mistakes is that we have a sin disease and Jesus came to die to be raised from the dead that we might be delivered from the disease of sin and given a new life and forgiven and maybe even this past week there was something that happened in your life where you failed And you feel the disgrace of that. Or maybe it was years and years ago and you haven't been able to get over it. I want to tell you today, when it comes to Jesus and our failures, there's grace. There's grace. You know, in our culture today, we like to hammer people like Steve Harvey who make mistakes. But that's not the way it is with Jesus. He loves us. And he comes to us. And he makes us new. Father, I pray that this morning that the message of her grace will soak deep into our hearts. And that we'll understand that there's no sin so deep, but that God's grace is deeper still. And we thank you in the name of Jesus.